Good morning and welcome to my neighborhood. Today we're talking about vaccines and variants. The two V's in our life this week. Hopefully not for too much longer, but um, that's what we've got. In British Columbia, here on the west coast of Canada, um, we have a, announcements that came out yesterday and it's interesting. We've got the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, both mRNA vaccines. And we've had a shortage of a supply, but we've managed to uh, vaccinate all of the people in long-term care and the death rates have fallen substantially. Um, they, they're rolling it out in phases. We're beginning phase two, doing a little bit of catch up on phase one as we go along. But they announced something interesting yesterday. They announced that they were changing the space between doses to 16 weeks. And this, this has raised a little bit of controversy, but not too much. The data that we're seeing coming out around the world in, I guess, what would be called phase four trials. Phase three are large private trials. Phase four, when you're, when you're vaccinating the public and keeping very good track of your data. So it, it's looking pretty good. What I wanted to do was just kind of do a quick review of what's going on around the world uh, in, in a limited sense. I'm. I'm no physician or epidemiologist or virologist, but I was listening to a, a really good analysis yesterday uh, from Medcram by Roger Schult. And he was covering material that isn't even in pre-press publication. So let's just do a quick summary. We've got the two mRNA um, vaccines We've got that are well known anyways and are have gone through phase three trials and have been approved for use in a variety of countries including canada we have the mr the moderna and the pfizer and mrna is is an interesting technology it's a, a new technology for vaccines and it encapsulates encapsulates um an rna strand that can provides instructions to build the spike protein and just the spike protein. In this case, both of them are building the spike protein. Um, then we have the AstraZeneca. This one is using an adenovirus that as a carrier for the spike protein information to take it into the cell and replicate it so the rest of the immune system, of course, can then respond to it. And this is true of the mRNA viruses as well. Now, the one that's just been approved in the US, the Jensen virus made by Johnson & Johnson, is also an adenovirus-based vaccine. And it's a little bit unique so far in that it requires only one dose and is relatively cheap, about 10 bucks a dose. The um, AstraZeneca, as far as I understand, and this is $10 US a dose, is $6 a dose, but you need two, plus the uh, infrastructure to deliver them. So, you know, $10 a dose might be quite a good deal in this case. Also, um, both of the adenovirus, one's AstraZeneca and the Jensen vaccine, uh, Johnson Johnson vaccine um, require much less rigorous refrigeration and delicate handling than the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines. Although Pfizer has now revised their, their recommendations for, for transport and storage to um, not quite so cold freezers required. Moderna, when they discovered that, and I'm going to use the, the place names rather than the numbers today, you know, because B, 
117 for the Kent or the UK version is much harder to sort out when we have a whole bunch of B's and P's and stuff like that. So I'm going to call it the UK variant, the South African variant, Brazilian, California or LA, and New York variants. And there's more, but those are the primary ones. So when Moderna realized that the effectiveness for their vaccine was lower in the South African variant, it seems to be fine for the the UK variant, within 30 days, they designed, implemented, and produced a new version. So now we have the interest, and it's been delivered to the National Health um, Body in the US and probably other places too. Uh, they, they did this, I think they started sometime in January, and so they finished in February. And this may be rolled out as a, a booster. We're not sure just how the rollout is going to go. Um, they're talking about rather than requiring a full set of long trials on it, as they did originally, just putting it in as an addition to the existing approvals. Um, so we're not quite sure where that's going. I'm not sure where Pfizer is on this. But we, there's several things that these vaccines are doing. One is reser reducing severity of illness. Another is reducing hospitalization and death. And the third one is reducing transmissibility. Now, the new variants, most of them, that are propagating uh, quite widely are more transmissible. You know this because they're propagating quite widely. It's not rocket science. They're out competing the other versions of the virus. But, uh, but why? And the current research has found that they both make better connection, the viral particles are more successful and most of them seem to generate more viral particles as well. So you get caught both ways. Now there's been some as yet unpublished studies, not even in pre-press, where they were looking at you can look at the Roger Schultz Medcram article for details on this, where they were looking at essentially petri dish studies, where they drew blood that had antibodies, and then they applied it to a normal SARS-CoV-2 and various variants, South African and uh, UK. I don't know whether they did the other ones either. And what they found is that they all worked. And what they did is kept diluting it till they found out at what level, relatively, it stopped working. Um, this is nowhere near a major immune reaction that your body launches. It's pretty silly in some ways but gives just a vague idea. And so it turned out that it required six times the antibodies present to deal with the South African one. Still dealt with it, but it, it required a much better immune response to deal with it. So, the, uh, there's a California version which has its own interesting properties. And we have a New York version, which evidently is currently representative of about 27% of the test, positive tests in New York. So, again, just to quickly review, we have 
Pfizer, Moderna, we have AstraZeneca. It's just been approved and will be started to be used in BC this week. We have Johnson Johnson, that's just been approved in the US and is starting to be used. But we also have a few others. We have the Sinovirus, or Sinovax um, vaccine from China. And it's, there doesn't seem to be any publicly available data on that, but there must be some because quite a few countries, including Turkey, for instance, have signed on to use it. Um, there was one country that had been using it, just as a, a small case study, and they had a long-term care facility with fragile and probably lots of comorbidities, and 40 of the 51 people in the facility contracted COVID and none of them got seriously ill. This was the people that had been vaccinated with the Sino, Sinovac. And there is, you know, everybody's ramping up production. This is the scarcest commodity in the world right now. But there's some funny things out there too. There's um, a German company called Covax, I think. And for most of this year, they've been working with Tesla. And Tesla has developed a mini RNA manufacturing port facility. This is a not too big device that could be deployed around the world to make RNA-based vaccines, and I assume for other purposes also, but I don't know. Um, as, as the testing ramped up, they put most of the resources into more traditional large-scale manufacturing so I don't know where the Tesla device is at now, but evidently it was being quite effective as early as July. And I think they were on the Model 3 in November or something. So there's some interesting things yet afoot and many other vaccines still in testing coming down the pike. Whew, stairs. So that's kind of a quick rundown. Oh, one other thing. People are kind of going, oh, I want the other one because, well, there's some nice testing that's come out of the UK recently on the AstraZeneca that's showing far more efficacy than we thought it would have, particularly in the elderly. Now, Health Canada has approved it for all ages. And when you start to look at this data, it's actually pretty good. So the problem is, is that all these vaccines, when you do um, level three, phase three testing, have all been done at different times in different places because you want to do the testing where there's a, an outbreak, where, whether it be initially in Washington state for the Moderna, or later in South Africa for some of the other ones, the environments are different. The climates are different, like the humidity and temperature around at the time of year and the place are different. The, hence the transmissibility, just from a physics point of view, is different. But also the number of people that already have had, um, have, been, have had COVID is, is also different. So it's very, very difficult, even if the protocols were identical between all these different studies, to say, oh, I'm gonna compare this with this. They're just not comparable that way. Um, the, the more useful data that we're getting right now is from the phase four studies. 
and that is like in Scotland where they're immunizing a lot of people and then they keep track right down to the lot number like they're doing here in BC of who got what when and they they start to track the infection rates and you can see the lines going out of who is infected and who is immunized and you get a spread and this was from uh, John Campbell's commentary yesterday he was reviewing a paper that showed a very nice graph and out 34 days he was still seeing the spread increase so that looks like and that was after the first shot of um, I think it was AstraZeneca but you were still seeing the spread increase. So we know that, you know, a minimum of three weeks to get through reasonable levels, but it looks like from those kind of charts, and these are population studies, the immunity continues to rise. So maybe Bonnie's right with this 16 weeks where you let the immunity build and then you give it a boost and maybe you've got a much longer, maybe, maybe, you end up with a much longer um, immunity. We're not sure yet. There is so many complications around all this stuff. You know, we have these escape mutations that happen, even if you, if you take out the complexity, even from a completely random thing, if you are stopping all these ones, the ones that get by are the ones that you transmit. And that's what happened to a large extent in Brazil, they thought they maybe had herd immunity, but what it did is it amplified the other variations, it looks like. So this is just a quick overview of the vaccines that are out there, what's coming, how they're being made, and the variants and how they're dealing with them. So mRNA, 30 days, they, they made... Um, what may be delivered as a vaccine in the future, but right now it's being looked at as a booster or perhaps just the second dose, we don't know yet. But they do very, you can do extreme fast turnaround with mRNA. The, the Chinese Sinovirus uh, vaccine is different because it's going really old school. It's using a deactivated virus, the whole thing. And in some ways, that provides way more targets for your immune system. The other ones are providing just the spike proteins and when they mutate, they don't work so well. But when they provide the entire vaccine, um, but not working, inactivated, then the immune system is gonna target all sorts of different parts of it. There is a really big supercomputer study that modeled the virus, not quite down to the molecular level, but down to groups of molecules. And one of the very interesting things that came out of it is that the virus clothes itself, wraps itself in glu glu glucon, glucons, um, basically sugar. And so that it's recognized as something normal in the body. It's wrapping itself in your stuff. So I'm wondering about that, but that's another topic. So we'll leave that today. Vaccines and variations on the virus. Interesting world. I'm so grateful for all the people that are taking care to maintain all our different layers of protection while we get these vaccines in place. It's a mammoth task and I, I thank all the people that are organizing it and getting it and just really working their tails off for the last year, seven, 24 by seven. But, but all of you too, because you're working awfully hard and this isolation is um, interesting. Not always in a good way. I think Ultimately, it will be our curiosity and humor that gets us through this. So thank you very much for listening. Click on the like and subscribe below. 
And um, as Bonnie says, be kind, be calm, and be safe. Thank you.